Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland, and I'm your host, Bill Stone. Today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Now, I had to tell um, the individual who had given me this challenge, a, I think of you were of mine, but definitely a long, long time friend of mine, many, many years, at least 20 years, that I've known this person, gave me a challenge, and that was to take a news article, because I often say it is scrolling past my lower third, it is damn near a secondary motto of this show, nothing you see in the press is real, nothing. And my contention is, based on my experience debunking the press, which is now 30 years, that with any press story, you can prove one of three things. That it never happened, that it didn't happen the way it was reported, or if you remove all the emotion of the loaded words and the propaganda and the opinions, the facts actually devolve to a very small number. So... What my uh, friend had done was, because he disagrees, and I can understand that, it's a, it's a big leap to make. The notion that nothing you see in the press is real is a big leap to make. So he, uh, he threw, I said to him, look, look, here's what you do. You get an article. I don't care what it is. Just give it to me flat out and, you know, I, I, without me reading it or anything, I will walk through it on my show and debunk it. What I had intended to do was to uh, maybe make two videos, an edited one, because I thought I might have to build various cards and stuff, but I was able to do that in advance without looking at the, uh, at the article. I was able to build these in advance. Uh, so I think I'm just going to do one show. It'd be longer, it'd be a little longer, but it's just going to be one show. Now, the other problem was, I already did this once. <laughs> I have now seen this article and debunked it. I'm sorry. I wish I didn't. But the fact was, when I put the web browser up on the screen, I was, I was recording at uh, 30 frames per second. When I put the web browser up on the screen, because my equipment is so ancient, it caused drop frames all over the place. I am now recording at 10 frames per second so that that doesn't happen. So I'm going to walk through this for a second time, but that probably means I won't change any of the content. I'm not changing the content in the slightest. No content will be changed. Maybe a little bit more fluid because I've now gone through it once. So I want to apologize. I had intended completely to do this totally without any forewarning. But I have now gone through it and recorded it once, and the recording looks like crap. So we're going to try it at 10 frames per second. And hopefully I'll get this before I have to go. So let us take a look at this article my friend gave us. Now, as I say, I contend that nothing you see in the press is real. And I have contended this for quite some time. I have contended it for 30 years since the first time, there are many, when I had a hatchet job done on me in a paper. In that particular case, I was at that time, as some of my regular viewers know, I was a, a long time ago at a galaxy far, far away. I was an actor. Uh, I was never a great actor. didn't make a ton of money on it. I uh, went into computer science because I wanted money. So um, I was acting at that time. I was doing summer stock at the C uh, City of Clinton Showboat Theater in Clinton, Iowa. And there was a woman from the newspaper who was doing... Um, she would do her interviews with cast and crew all throughout the summer and, you know, just kind of go from one to the next to the next week. Same person did it every single year. And the people who ran the city of Clinton Showboat Theater was there for all the time warned us that for some reason the woman doing these articles liked to do hatchet jobs, just liked to do it, liked to make everybody look bad. And so they would tell us, be careful what you say, she'll take any opening. I knew what that meant. And she did do that. She took any opening and t used it to make a hatchet job. And the reason I know that is, in the mid-1980s, I'm forgetting, ex forgetting exactly when, must have been about 1984-ish, um, Deborah Winger and a number of other big-name actors, uh, Shirley MacLaine, um, gosh, I don't know if Jack Nicholson came up, uh, but a number of them came to Lincoln, Nebraska, because they were shooting parts of Terms of Endearment, the film Terms of Endearment, in Lincoln. Well, I was a theater student at the time, and so one of my buddies and I, we forged a press credentials so we could go to a reception. Uh, actually, it was a press uh, conference that was being held at a local hotel uh, with Deborah Winger. I mean, you know, at that time, a passable movie star. 
so we got this in because we thought, man, you know, how, what kind of, you know, when, when are we going to have a chance to do this, you know, uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska? So we forged press credentials. We showed up. Uh, we got in. And now think about this. Deborah Winger had literally just flown into town. When I use the word literally, I'm not using that as some kind of, it's literally. She had flown into town, landed the municipal airport, got in a limo, drove to the hotel, got out and went in, was escorted into this ballroom, into this auditorium. That's all she'd seen of Lincoln, Nebraska. Now, Lincoln at that time was about 150,000 people. It's about 250,000 now. And we're about um, half an hour to 45 minutes drive away from Omaha, Nebraska, which is a metro area of 1 million people. All she'd seen of this city of 150,000 at that time was what you could see from the air and what you see driving down a couple of streets on the way to the hotel. That's all. That's all she saw. So they're asking the usual dumb questions, you know, blah, 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 blah. And they get to one of the other dumb questions, which was this. What are you going to do in Lincoln when you're not shooting? And, you know, this is Lincoln, Nebraska, a city of 150,000, obviously much smaller than the Los Angeles area that she was from. And she said, well, let me tell you. Entertainers usually have very pat answers for a question like this because they don't want to offend anyone. What they usually say is something like, um, well, I've only seen Lincoln from the air, but it's such a beautiful city, and there are such wonderful people here. They've been so nice and friendly. It's totally different than Los Angeles. Frankly, I can't wait to get out, go out and explore. And then she should have put a big old smile on her face and said, who wants to show me around for the cameras? That's what she should have done, but she didn't. She said, quote, I don't know. Is there anything to do? end quote. Big mistake. And she learned from it the hard way. The press then painted her, did complete hatchet jobs on her, both television and print, which were basically the only things at that time. Total hatchet jobs. I went to the reception afterwards. The reception afterwards, I went to that and I, you know, met her. I shook her hand. I said, uh, nice to meet you, Miss Winger. It's just, you know, I, I really enjoyed some of the work you've done. That was all I did. Just shook her hand. Said, nah. She was a little, she had a little drink. She was not really drunk. I mean, she wasn't really drunk. She didn't do or say anything a fully sober person wouldn't do. She was noticeably barely a little drunk. You know, she had had a drink. She was loose. You know, she was relaxed. That's about the only thing you could say about her. But the press, the entire press, statewide, painted her as a drunken whore. They literally made it all up. I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. The press made it all up. And they didn't collude. They didn't get together and talk about this. They each individually manufactured this story because she had said one thing wrong. I don't know. Is there anything to do? They made up a story about a drunken whore who was hitting on everybody, and that she had said bad things about Lincoln and, by extension, the entire state of Nebraska, we should all be insulted and stuff. Totally made up. Completely made up. I was there. I know what I saw. She was a little drunk, didn't do anything that a fully sober person wouldn't do. She was kind of relaxed. That's all. She was just kind of relaxed. And they made up these stories statewide. So I knew going into that when they did the hatchet job on me a few years later in 1988 that that's what I was looking at. And at that point I said to myself, you know, this seems kind of widespread. And over the course of the next number of years in my life, it happened that I worked with a CNN reporter, got it all wrong. I worked with a reporter from the Chicago Sun-Times who made stuff up. Chicago Sun-Times, it was a thing where it was, it was a story about, uh, you know, little guy versus city hall. Well, they were on the side of the little guy. I was on the side of the little guy. I'm usually, I usually know how to deal with the press. It's real simple. You say, okay, you can ask them sometimes, what's your angle? Because they are assigned a point of view from the editors or whomever, the producers. They are assigned a point of view from which to write or produce a story. So what you need to do is you say to them, what's your angle? I don't know if that's still what they call it. That's what I was always taught. What's your angle? Where are you coming at the story from? So what's your angle? And they'll usually tell you, and then you tailor your statements to support their angle, and you will get your word out. 
And the reason this works is they go out there and they don't usually deal with people who know how to do that, manipulate them that way. And they will get there and they'll go around interviewing people. Well, if they find people who have quotes that they can use that will support their angle, great, wonderful, they can write their story in fairly short order. But if they don't, they can't find people who, uh, uh, you know, are, can, whose quotes can be used to support their angle. They write them as though they're hostile some way. They, they write them as bad. They sensationalize it so that they're bad. And if there's absolutely nothing they can use, this is when the purporter's down to the wire on their, uh, on their story and they've got to come up with something. They make stuff up all the time. And I say, in one case, it was a CNN reporter. And in another case, it was the Chicago Sun-Times where they literally made up quotes. I looked at the paper the next day with my ex-wife, now, now ex, and I said, wow, those are some really good quotes. I wish it had occurred to me to say them. <laughs> totally made up. Totally made up. And that's how it's been with me and the press for the last 30 years. And I have spent, as a hobby, 30 years debunking them. So, um, Mark. Again, apologize, I already did this once, and that's going to make it flow a little better, but you're not going to see anything here that I did not do my first recording around. If you want to see the first recording, I'll be happy to show it to you. It just looks like crap. Okay, so Mark, uh, one of my viewers, a good old friend of mine, had said, uh, I said to him, look, I, you know, you don't think this is real. I, I, you think the press is telling us the truth sometimes. Give me a story, any story. I will not look at it in advance. I will then go through on my show and debug it. Debunk it, rather. So here we are. I will show you the story that he gave me. Again, I've recorded it once, but at that time when I first looked at it, it was the very first time that I had seen it. So this is sort of a repeat for me, but again, all I'm doing is the exact same thing. So I'm going to show you some stuff. Now, I want to tell you in advance. Here's, here's what we're shooting for, right? This is what all reporters, this is what every reporter should be shooting for. And we... As people who are reading this, we must be shooting for as well. We want to be what Heinlein, Robert A. Heinlein wrote in his book, Stranger in a Strange Land. We want to be what he called a fair witness. Now, a fair witness was someone who did not make any assumptions about anything that they had not personally seen, touched, felt, tasted, etc. Anything that they could not sense with their own senses while they were on the job, they made no assumptions about. So, for example, if you took a fair witness outside to your front yard and you said, what color is the house across the street? The fair witness would look at that and they'd say, it's white on this side. It would not occur to them. They would never assume that the other sides were white. Now, if you took them over and walked them around one by one, they could say, this one's white right now. That one's white right now. That one's white right now. And we're back to the front. It's white right now. But... The fair witness would not assume that the house would stay white. The moment they turned their backs, the moment they were not observing it with their own senses, for all they knew, the house could suddenly, spontaneously turn green on the sides that they were not looking at at that time. You make only assumptions, and I'm going to do that. I did it. It was way too long when I did it the first time, so that's one of the things about doing it a second time that's going to be good. I'm going to be able to walk through that and make it more clear to you. But... <laughs> We're going to do that with a picture, and we always do that with the text. So here is the article that I was given. I'm hoping that I'm not dropping frames coming at you at 10 frames per second as opposed to 30. So here's what we got. Um, this story from USA Today. No, this was printed on Tuesday. I think this is my, this, uh, what I'm doing now is either going to go up on uh, late Thursday or Friday. And I had, I had planned, maybe, to do an edited version where I took out some stuff in a non-edited version. Well, since I've gone through this the second time and it'll flow a little better, I'm only going to make a single one. And that will either drop late Thursday or Friday, depending on how long it takes to encode the video. So, here we are with the story. No mail. Well, let me get a drink. You'll also see me put on my glasses from time to time so I can read the text a little better. Here is the headline to this story. No mail will be delivered to two parts of 10 states as polar vortex chills postal delivery. Okay, stop right there. We have a little bit of emotion, a little bit of language, and sensationalism. 
They are saying no mail will be delivered to parts of 10 states. Got it. As polar vortex. Okay, stop right there. Constantly referring to this thing as a vortex is emotionally loaded language. Words have meanings beyond their simple, um, you know, the literal translation. I'll give you an example of this. It's a foreign language, but it's true to English as well. There is a French word. I speak French. There is a French word, salope. Um, you might find this amusing. The, um, the literal translation of that is usually slut or bitch. That is not the emotional connotation in French. There is no word for what salope really means in French. Um, we do not have a word in English that really describes it. The real emotional connotation behind a salope in French falls somewhere between slut and the C word. <laughs> it's real bad. It's worse than slut. It's not as bad as the C word if you're calling somebody that, but it's worse than slut. We do not have a word for it, but that is the emotional connotation beyond the literal translation of slut. This is actually a worse word. So when we look at a word vortex, a vortex is something swirling around and being horrifying, a vortex. It may be true that this is technically a polar vortex, but constantly referring to it like that is sensationalism. And a chilling postal, chill, uh, chill is an emotional little language, chills, oh, we get the chills. So we would rewrite this if we were doing this correctly as real journalists. No mail will be delivered to parts of 10 states due to cold. Uh, moving on here, um, all of this, ignore it, has nothing to do with this article. All of this, ignore it, anything on the sidebar has nothing to do with this article. We ignore these pictures. Get my out. And we have the first sentence, so much for neither snow nor, nor, rain, nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night. Get rid of the whole sentence, it has nothing to do with anything. This is a story about how cold things, cold in uh, in ten, parts of ten states, are going to shut down USPS. That means nothing. It is emotionally loaded. It is sensationalism. We're getting rid of it. That whole sentence. Second sentence: The U.S. mail won't be delivered Wednesday in large swaths. Hold it right there. We always look for emotionally loaded language, and swath is an emotionally loaded, loaded word. Swath is something. It's a big swath. It's a large swath like cutting something. So we don't get rid of that word. We can say be delivered Wednesday uh, in at least 10 states due to the crippling stop. Crippling cold part of, uh, of the polar vortex. Stop. Crippling. Oh, it's crippled. He can't walk. He's missing an arm. He's missing a leg. He's crippled. No, 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 no. Crippled is an emotionally loaded light word. We get rid of it. Um, polar vortex again, constantly referring to it by that in the press and everywhere else is sensationalism at this point. So, uh, if they were explaining it from a scientific perspective and saying it is a polar vortex because of this, yes, that's fine in an article describing it. Otherwise, it's just cold. Otherwise, you're just using this word vortex, a vortex, you know, it's like a black hole, a vortex of gravity pulling everything in. It's terrible and horrifying. It's a vortex. You know, same with crippling cold. It's the crippling cold of the polar vortex. You know, throw it all out. U.S. mail won't be delivered Wednesday in parts of at least 10 states due to cold. That's how I'd rewrite it if I was doing it right. Next paragraph. The USP USP announced that no mail will be delivered to parts of Michigan, Iowa, Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Uh, that is a factual statement. I went out to their website on the first go-round on this and checked. Yes, that is true. They announced that. However, there were other states that were not involved. Let me count that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, they didn't have mail service delivered here in Lincoln, Nebraska, either. Nebraska is left out of there. Other states may have been as well. They didn't get the full news here. They only got part of it. They screwed up the facts somewhere. And... USPS knew this. They told us that we weren't getting mail yesterday. US did, but they blew it. They do not have the full facts here. They blew it. Uh, let's see. Some retail offices of the Postal Service will be open, but couriers won't be delivering any mail to those areas. That is a factual statement. It's not the first time that mail carriers won't deliver to certain addresses due to bad weather. That's absolutely true. 
First go around on this, I looked it up. The uh, yesterday was very cold. Wednesday, which is what they they did this on Tuesday for Wednesday. Yesterday, Wednesday was very cold. Uh, overnight, I think it probably got to about negative ten degrees. Uh, the high was around negative one, and with the wind chill, it never got above negative ten degrees. Um, so it was really cold. Um, and it's not the first time that they don't deliver certain addresses. So that's happened before. And I looked up. The, the yesterday was not the coldest day on record anywhere in Nebraska. The coldest day on record in Nebraska happened in 1989. It was negative 47 degrees. What you have to understand is this part of the country, and I know this from having lived there, if you take the chunk of the country that goes from Chicago all the way out to the Black Hills of South Dakota, which is a thousand miles or so, I haven't looked it up, but around a thousand miles, and you take a 500 mile or so section that goes from just south of Lincoln, Nebraska, up to basically the border. Well, no, if you, uh, let's say uh, I-90-ish. From here to I-90, several hundred miles. You have a, a, a section of the country that is, notice I almost used the word swath there, a section of the country, I'm, being, I'm just trying to be scientific here, section of the country where the... Um, the, we the weather is extraordinarily variable. Everywhere I've lived has a saying that goes like this. Don't like the weather in, insert wherever the hell you live, wait five minutes, it'll change. And that's true, that's true. Yesterday was negative 10 with the wind chill. They are now predicting 40 degrees this weekend. A 50 degree change in a matter of a couple of days. And that's not unusual around here. Don't like the weather, wait five minutes, it'll change. <clears throat> in that entire region of the country, that's true. And that includes Chicago. So, um, it, it's not unusual here to have really cold winters sometimes. Now, this is particularly cold, but it's not horrifyingly so. Negative one, negative ten, and wind chill. I've seen that a million times. I've seen it a million times. Don't know how many winters I've seen that temperature. Now, other places, it's worse than it usually is. I think Chicago, it's probably a little bit worse. But not much, not much. And the variable weather is what we see. Today, we've got several inches of snow that's been plowed from other snowfalls. It'll be melting by... <laughs> It'll be melting by Saturday if we get 40 degrees. But let's move on. It's not the first time that mail carriers won't deliver to certain addresses due to bad weather, but typically those scenarios, a scenario is a emotionally loaded word, we get rid of it, typically those incidents, that's a better word, incidents happen on a street or two that is blocked off by snowdrifts. In Wednesday's case, it is the forecast for extreme cold, which is hitting the Midwest particularly hard. Stop there. It is the forecast for extreme cold. Done. Because as I've said, Midwest, this area from Chicago all the way out to the western South Dakota and Nebraska, we have extraordinarily variable weather. Hitting us hard is not really the case. This is not terrifyingly unusual. That's why sensationalizing this polar vortex is sensationalism. There is lots of winters where this stuff happens around here. Okay, um, so in that sentence we'd say in Wednesday's case, it is the forecast for extreme cold, period. This picture I'm going to go through in a minute. This picture has absolutely nothing to do with this article. I will walk through it in a moment as a fair witness, uh, looking at it elsewhere, but this picture actually has nothing to do with this article, and we can tell by looking at the caption. On the eve of the polar vortex, eve, stop. Eve means night. It's not night in this picture. Maybe they mean the day before. Maybe they mean Tuesday. So let's say uh, Tuesday, sometime Tuesday, David Collins, 36, hey, good to get his name, uh, clears the snow from the walkways and driveways of his front home in January uh, 29th, 2019. Yay, we got a date and a citation. Uh, this picture occurred on January 29th, 1918. That means it has absolutely squat to do with this story about postal service being shut down. That has nothing to do with it. And we're going to walk through that as a fair witness in the short. Doing a uh, prediction here. Bad idea to do predictions in this part of the country. Um, our, our weather forecasters are wrong more often than they're right. We will often have times where we get a blizzard that we did not expect. <laughs> happens happens at, you know, at least once every two years. At least and probably more. Because the weather is so damn variable 
that you really, in the wintertime, it's really impossible to predict much of anything. So we're doing a prediction here that's a bad thing to do, as it happens. As it happens, I know from having done this once before, that uh, their prediction happened to be pretty much accurate. But it is still a prediction. It was done on Tuesday. That was still a prediction at this point. And that's a bad thing to do in this part of the country. On Wednesday, Chicago will be colder than parts of Antarctica, Alaska, and North Pole. Stop there. Yeah, that's probably true. Alaska is a large land mass that reaches very far north and much farther south than you would imagine. Antarctica is a huge continent that reaches much farther north. Everything starts south there. Much farther north in many directions than you can imagine. Much farther north. Um, north Pole, same deal. It's an ice sheet, but it's still much of it reaches farther south than you would imagine. So yes, when you get a very, very, very bad cold like this one for the winter. Oh, absolutely. There's going to be parts of Antarctica and Alaska and the North Pole that are warmer. But guess what? That happens a lot in the winters around here. That's not unusual. Those large, large man land areas are not frighteningly cold everywhere. You know, there are parts of it that are just really cold. And so being colder than that is not unusual. The large, large land areas. This is sensationalism we're looking at here. Um, that is sensationalism, all of it. Um, we could say, okay, uh, on Wednesday, Chicago will be so cold, because that's all you can say. It, Wednesday, Chicago is forecasted to be cold. This is a forecast. So we would say we would cut all of that stuff out about Alaska, Antarctica, and North Pole, because it's irrelevant. It happens all the freaking time around here. On Wednesday... Chicago is forecasted to be Chicago the Chicago forecast is so cold that we could say that on Wednesday the Chicago forecast is so cold that another also a little piece of language comes up scores of schools stop scores is a uh, emotionally loaded word we would say some on Wednesday Chicago's forecast is so cold that some schools, city halls, businesses, and even zoos will be closed across the region. Stop. Even zoos. <laughs> That's just emotionally loaded. They're saying, even zoos. Even zoos will be closed. No, 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 not even zoos. Of course they'll be closed, for God's sake. Why wouldn't they? So we would say on Wednesday, the forecast for Chicago is so cold that some schools, city halls, businesses, and zoos will be closed, closed about the, across the region. Everything else in there is some level of sensationalism. Next paragraph, the Windy City's high. Stop. Windy City is, an, uh, is, uh, is Chicago, but not everybody would know that. Not everybody would know that. We would say Chicago. Chicago's quote-unquote high. Stop. Putting it in quotes is emotionally loaded. It makes it sound like it's much worse. Chicago's high is going to be. No, 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 no. Just it's high. Just it's high. So Chicago's high temperature on Wednesday should be around 10 degrees below zero. I haven't known that was factually accurate. It was certainly accurate here. We get very similar weather to Chicago. It's only that we get it maybe 12 to 24 hours before they do. This In this case, with all the wind coming in off the prairie, yeah, we got, they got it shortly after we did. But this was accurate. This actually happened. But again, this is still a, uh, a forecast. Bad idea to do in this part of the country. You're wrong more often than you're right. However, in this case, they were right. So, Wendy City, I'm sorry, we'll say Chicago's high temperature on Wednesday should be, yay, around uh, 10 below zero. Yeah. While the overnight low Wednesday night into Thursday morning is forecast to be in the 25 degree below degree range, uh, according to the National Weather Service in Chicago. Okay, good. We didn't have to change much in that paragraph. We just had to substitute Windy City for Chicago, get rid of the quotes around high, and uh, remember that this is a forecast that oftentimes they're wrong more than they're right. Next two ones are links to things that do not matter to this story. Ignore them. Okay. Well, this is a real fun one. Well, this is a real fun one. I'm going to go through the next three paragraphs because the first time I did it, I ended up going along on them, but they're easy to explain once you've done it. 
Next paragraph. But even with the lack of mail service mail delivery Wednesday, there is no real bra- breach of a postal service motto. While many people believe that neither so- snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds is an official post- post- motto of the postal service. It is not. Next paragraph. Ignore this picture. Has nothing to do with this article. Next paragraph. According to USPS, while the Polar Postal Service has no official motto, the popular belief is that it does is a tribute to America's postal workers. The words above, thought to be a, the motto, are chiseled in gray granite over the entrance to the New York City Post Office on 8th Avenue. Next paragraph. The words, according to USPS, came from Book 1, Paragraph 8 of the Persian Wars by Herodotus. During uh, the uh, wars between the Greeks and Persians, 500-499 B.C., Persians operated a system of mounted postal carriers who served with great fidelity. While the Postal Service does not have an official motto, it does have an official mission statement, and this is apparently a quote because it's in italics. The Postal Service shall have at its basic function the obligation to provide postal services to bind the nation together through the personal, educational, literary, and business correspondence of the people. It shall provide prompt, reliable, and efficient services to patrons in all areas and shall render postal services to all communities. Okay, let us stop for a moment and take a look at those paragraphs. We're in a story that is about uh, cold weather and halting postal service. This paragraph, this paragraph, this paragraph, this paragraph, this paragraph have nothing whatsoever to do with this article. It's a nice little history lesson, but it has nothing to do with postal service being closed. It is filler. It has nothing to do with this article. We throw it completely out. All of those paragraphs we throw out from this article. One, two, three, four, five paragraphs. Cut them. Cut them all out. And then the final one. There is no word yet on when mail service will resume in the affected regions. That is a factual statement. So let me read through this article now that we have edited it. And again, forget all of the pictures. This has nothing to do with it. This this is not a picture of uh, of people who are, you know, on Wednesday being affected. Nothing to do with it. None of these 47 pictures. They're just pictures of people in snow. We don't even know where they are. They could be in Alaska for all we know. Again, we're trying to be fair witnesses. Looking at these pictures, can we tell where they're from? No. It's irrelevant. We get rid of them, ignore them. Same here. Who cares? doesn't matter. This has nothing to do. Here's a few things you don't want to leave in your car during the polar vortex. Okay, <laughs> it has nothing to do with this article. It's nice that they mentioned it, but it doesn't have anything to do with this article, so we get rid of the picture. We ignore it. We ignore this one because I already, I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you some fair witness stuff on this, but we ignore it because it actually has nothing to do with this article. This is a guy shoveling his walkway the day before in Detroit. Nothing to do with this article. Nothing at all. It has nothing to do with close, postal service not being done. So, let us walk through this article as I have now edited it to be more factually accurate. No mail will be delivered to ten parts of 10 states due to cold. U.S. mail won't be delivered Wednesday in parts of at least 10 states due to the cold. The USPS announced there will be no mail delivered in Michigan, Iowa, Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and they missed at least Nebraska. Some retail offices of the Postal Service will be open, but couriers won't be delivering any mail to those areas. That's factual. It's not the first time mail carriers won't deliver to certain addresses by weather, but typically these um, scenarios wasn't a bad word to use. These um, incidents, yeah. Uh, it's not the first time that mail carriers won't deliver to a certain addresses due to bad weather, but typically these incidents happen on a street or two that is blocked by snow drift. In Wednesday's case, it is forecast. It is the forecast for extreme cold, period. And again, keep in mind, this is not as bad as it's gotten. 1989, lowest temperature ever recorded in Nebraska was minus 49 degrees before the wind chill. Again, ignore this paragraph, ignore that that picture. On Wednesday, Chicago will be colder than parts of, okay, we get rid of that, doesn't matter, it's true. We could say on Chicago, Wednesday will be cold and some schools, city halls, businesses, and even zoos will be closed. I'm sorry, get rid of even. On Wednesday, Chicago will be cold and scores um, and some schools, city halls, businesses, and zoos will be closed. Chicago's high temperature on Wednesday should be around 10 below zero. 
while the overnight low Wednesday night into Thursday morning is forecast to be in the negative 25 below range, according to the National Weather Service in Chicago. And then ignore, 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 ignore. There's no word on yet on when mail will resume in the affected regions. That is what I talk about. When I say nothing you see in the press is real, what I mean is, when you look at the article and look at it as a fair witness and take out everything, what you're left with is one of three things, that it never happened, that it didn't happen the way it's reported, or that when you remove all of the extraneous, emotionally loaded language, um, the opinions, the parts that have nothing to do with the article, and the outright propaganda, of which there is some in this, you find that you are left with very few facts. We, uh, you know, we were left with maybe two or th just like four paragraphs, something like that, all of which needed to be edited to take out all the emotionally loaded language. Nothing you see in the press is real. Nothing. There's so much in this that is just propaganda and literally nothing to do with the article. So let us take a look at this picture, because I was intrigued by this picture the first go around. Again, I'm sorry, Mark, I had no choice. 60, the 30 frames per second was killing it, and I did not know until after I got done. So I was able to find a nice, large version of this. This is the full resolution of this picture. Great. I love when I can do that. That's awesome. As somebody who's lived in this area my entire life, I can tell you that this is a posed picture. It is intended to make things look worse than they are. It is a bit of sensationalism. Here's how we know it's posed. To begin with, this man, we assume he's a man. Again, I'm going into this now as fair witness mode to some extent. Partly I'm driven by my own experience having had lots and lots of snow to have to show over the course of my 54 years in this part of the country. We know this is a posed picture to begin with because this guy is looking at the camera. It's a posed picture. When you're doing this type of snow removal, you must look at the ground. <laughs> if you look up, you're not going to get the snow removed. You have to look at the ground. So we know this is posed. We also know this is posed due to the enormous amount of snow coming off of his shovel. Here in this part of the country, we do have shovels like this, and they're not the flat shovels, the wimpy old flat shovels that you get. They're a curved bladed shovel because you have them on the ground and you're basically pushing up large chunks of snow, and he has a curved blade shovel like that. He's also overfilled it, and he is chucking it up way higher than it needs to be out of the way so that they can get this picture of what looks like a lot of of snow coming off of it. A ton of snow is coming off of that thing, but it is posed. That does not happen by accident. That is not the way you shovel that snow. That is posed, intending to put more snow coming off of that shovel than there actually is. And he has overfilled it, and he is throwing it up in such a way that it comes out of the blade. You don't do that. You never do that. You shovel with the blade down, period, and only pull the blade up when you have to throw the snow off. And you don't overfill it like that. You overfill it, and it's just going to fall back. That's what's happening here, in point of fact. Look at how that snow is falling straight back to where he has just shoveled. You don't shovel like that. You don't overfill the blade. This is there as sensationalism to make that snow look deeper than it is. And let me show you something about the deepness and depth of that snow. Look at the man feet. Okay, when you have snow that's really bad in our part of the country, and I mean two feet or higher, that happens. When you have snow that is really bad, you do not go out in sneakers, high top sneakers, like he's wearing there. You can't. If you go out in high top sneakers, the snow's going to be up mid thigh, maybe higher. And your feet, you're going to get snow in those high tops, and it's going to melt, it's going to get cold, it might freeze you might get frostbite on your feet. The snow is not particularly deep here. You notice it is not any higher in either of his feet. It is not higher than the central part of his, uh, what looked to me like high top sneakers. The snow ain't that bad there. Um, it may get bad, but it's not bad there now. Looking at this as a fair witness, however, again, those are things that I can say from my own experience. This is a sensationalized photo intended to make things look worse than they are. 
However, as a fair witness, here's what we can say about this man. There is an individual, an African American, appears to be male because he has a, this person has a beard. I'll call him male. Fair witness, just saying what this guy looks like. Try not to make assumptions about him, but I'll say he's male. It's an African American male with a beard looking at the camera who is wearing a dark colored coat. Again, this is a post picture. He's wearing a dark colored coat. I'm pulling out of fair witness mode for a moment. In our weather like this, you can't go out without, glo without gloves, and you can't go out without a much heavier coat than he's got. And probably a, uh, you know what? Hang for just a minute, and I'll show you what you have to go out in. Here's a couple of visual aids. But you have to go out, and if you really got some bad weather, like we have today, when I go to pick up my mom from her work, because her car, car wouldn't start this morning, it's too cold. When I go out to pick up my mom, I'm going to be wearing these. Okay? These are my hunting gloves, but they work well for this, right? This means I'm going to have some fingers, but I don't keep it out for very long, not in wind chill like that. Put it back on. I'll be wearing a pair of those on my hands when I go out. I did this morning. And one of these. Hell, I'll put it on so you know what it looks like. This is what you wear in this weather. This. With this pulled down, this pulled up, and this nice and freaking tight. This is what you wear in bad weather. This is what you wear when the weather was like it was yesterday. And today. Because if you don't, you'll die. With the weather as bad as it was and the cold as bad as it was, if you're not wearing that, you will get frostbite on any part of your body that is, not, that is exposed to the air. So looking at this picture, I can say the temperature wasn't even that bad because he's not even got gloves and his face is not fully covered. And he's not wearing boots like he should in something like that. Oh, back into fair witness mode. What we say about this man is African-American male, male wearing a black uh, wool hat a uh, dark coat of some kind, not a large coat, a pair of blue jeans, and black high top sneakers. He is holding in his hand a shovel with a black handle, a uh, light colored uh, 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 rod, and then uh, a uh, shovel blade on the end, which is overfilled and is uh, throwing up snow as he uh, shovels. We can also say that there is an area of ground that is, has been shoveled. We don't know if he did it. Fair witness, we don't know. This is a still picture. All we can say is what's going on in the picture. There is an area of ground that has been, area of uh, patch of area that has been shoveled. And we can say things like, uh, you know, the area around it is uh, snow covered, but it doesn't look deep. Uh, if we compare it, you know, look at the back of this car, right? In, in really bad snow around here, the snow is going to be packed up to nearly the fender. So the snow ain't that bad. Um, so we can say, okay, that it's got a co covering of snow uh, everywhere on the ground that we can observe. We can also say things about uh, the structures on the left and the right. We can talk about the utility pole here. Uh, we can talk about the color of the structure, where the windows are placed, uh, the fact that there is a uh, you know, fence here, uh, window placement here, the color of things around here, some of the structures we don't make no uh, 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 assumptions. We do not assume that this thing that looks like a door is a door. We cannot see if there's a door there. We just know that there is a structure with a triangular shaped roof and two um, posts of some kind. Actually, if you zoom in on it, it's totally obscured. We can't see for sure. We can see that there is something that looks like an opening here, but we can't say it's the door for sure. We can talk about the windows that are there. We can talk a little bit about this car, but we make no assumptions about what the make and model of that car is. We just describe it. And similarly, we can describe this tree. We can just say that there are bushes here that are unfortunately obscured. We can't say much about those. We can say there are branches over here. We don't say it's a tree. We don't know if it's coming from a tree. Maybe there's somebody out of, out of frame holding up a branch. We don't know. And we can, so we can talk about the stuff that's in the background. We can talk about this individual and things that are in the background. And that's what we do as fair witnesses. We don't make assumptions. That tree one is a perfect example. How do we know? There isn't somebody just outside a frame holding a branch in front of it. We don't know. I mean, we, we could assume it's a tree, but we don't know that for sure.
We don't know that for sure, especially since this is a posed photo. This is a posed photo. So, back to this. Again, uh, I read through the article as it would be if you're getting rid of all the extraneous crap and you ignore every single image on this page because it has nothing to do with a story about having lack of mail service. It's all just junk. So as I said, opening up uh, when I, you know, I said, when I say nothing that you see in the press is real, I mean that one of three things is true. It never happened. It didn't happen as it was reported. Or when you strip off all the emotionally loaded language, all the propaganda, and all the stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with the story, you discover that the facts evolve to, in this case, maybe three paragraphs, three or four paragraphs. And every one of those had to be edited every single paragraph. I don't think you'd be left with more than one sentence in each paragraph once you edit it, maybe one or two. Nothing that you see in the press is real. So if you like what I'm doing, that's all I'm going to do on that one. If you like what I'm doing, please do like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, and pets, and livestock to do the same. And if you do like what I'm doing and you want to um, you know, contribute to me, I have a link in below to my subscribe star and my PayPal tip jar, as well as a link to a place on my website where you can see my, uh, I have an Amazon wish list that you can buy things from for me if you want to. Uh, the biggest thing on there that I'd love to have would be a laptop that I've got listed there, which gets cheaper and cheaper at all times. It is not a highest end laptop you can get. It is getting lower all the time, but it will do what I want to. It'll mean I can do this sort of thing like I did only once and then do it in 60 frames per second at 1080p rather than what I'm doing now, 10 frames per second to 720p and crossing my damn fingers until I look at this uh, afterwards to see if I didn't have dropped frames. So that laptop will make everything disappear. If you want to buy the laptop for me, you become the program director of my show. You can tell me what to talk about, when to talk about it, and when to drop it. Um, but uh, if you do uh, contribute financially, that will all go toward the laptop. So... Um, if you want to you know, support me, those are the three ways you can do it. Uh, I have that stuff on my website because if I put a, uh, a link to a uh, Amazon wish list here, YouTube may give me a copyright strike. So I would say that, you know, thank you very much for watching. Like, sub, hit the notification bell. Thank you very much if you're contributing to me. I enjoy that very much and I enjoy doing the show. So that is Tales from SYO Ranch for today. News and commentary from the heartland. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.